Martin Drury is the CEO of Health Poverty Action, HPA, a politically progressive NGO with programs in 17 countries. With 400 staff worldwide, mostly originating from communities they serve, HPA works with some of the world's poorest and most marginalized populations. Martin has worked in the international development sector for over 30 years. He was co-founder of the trade justice movement and one of the leaders of Make Poverty History and several other high profile campaigns. Thank you everyone for joining and good morning from the UK where I am, the day is just starting. So I'm speaking from uh, the organization called Health Poverty Action. That's um, uh, our website. We've got health and development programs in 15 countries, about 400 staff worldwide. And um, we also have a, a small campaigns team that does policy and lobbying at a global level. So that's the, the perspective that we're, we're coming from. In particular, we're rooted in a global people's movement called the PHM, uh, the People's Health Movement. And the principles behind that underpin a lot of the approaches I'm going to talk about. And I particularly want to recognize uh, uh, the analysis that comes from the movement, and particularly uh, Professor David Sanders, who was until recently um, an elder of the movement and is now an ancestor. It dates back to a groundbreaking UN conference in 1978 called Palmer Arta. This was the biggest UNICEF, UN, uh, biggest WHO conference that's ever been held. It was held jointly with UNICEF. And it was looking at an approach to health that became known as the primary health care approach. So it's a conference on primary health care. And it was associated very much with the concept of achieving health for all by the year 2000. So it was in a sense, it was one of the first forerunners of the SDGs. Um, so we would achieve health for all by the year 2000 for a lot of reasons that uh, I, I won't go into now. By the year 2000, you didn't have a health for all. You had uh, a global health crisis. And in those early years after the Almorata conference, for a few years, there was a new approach to global health and uh, health systems around the world were being restructured. And, but then that didn't continue, it changed, and there was more privatisation brought into healthcare, a, a variety of, of, of policy changes. And as a protest against betrayal, in a way, of the, the Almorata commitments that were made by uh, very high-level representations at that UN conference, the same movement of people who'd been campaigning for it called the People's Health Assembly. And at that point, they uh, produced a, a guiding document, was a founding document for the People's Health Movement called the People's Charter for Health, uh, being translated into more languages than the, the Bible. And you can download a lot of the resources. Um, it's a very broad movement, a, a lot of academics involved with it, but also a lot of grassroots people's organisations and organisations like uh, our own Health Poverty Action. And in particular, I'd like to recommend a, a series of books called Global Health Watch. The background to those is that the WHO each year would produce, it doesn't do it now, but it used to produce a, a World Health Report. And this was meant as an alternative to that. Um, uh, the movement's actually you know, very supportive, a critical friend of, of the WHO, but it was... Um, uh, there were a lot of some of the more political analysis, such as the things that you've just been hearing from Ganesh, were, um, uh, weren't included in the, the World Health Report, was impacted profoundly on global health. So the Global Health Watch is a, a series of peer-reviewed books that comes out every few years that um, includes some of that analysis. And it's all downloadable for free. So this concept of primary health care, what was so special about it? So even today, at, uh, in the WHO, in the, uh, the World Health Assembly, that it still has political capital. It's still a source of thought leadership and a rallying call for particular priorities in terms of global health. So what are they? In essence, it was... It was a very politicised approach to health, really. It was saying that healthcare isn't just the responsibility of the health sector. It's not just about curing disease, to say the very least. It's, it's about prevention and looking at the primary 
primary determinants of health. It's not the primary level of the health service. It's what are the primary determinants of health, which are often about poverty, very, very strong focus on uh, disarmament, converting armament expenditure, healthcare expenditure, um, a lot about uh, uh, gender issues, uh, and a huge amount about community leadership and the primacy of patients and people's own power over the determinants of their health. This quote sums up uh, a lot of the, uh, the essence of it, Rudolf uh, Virchow, who is a technical expert, very much uh, the, the, the founder of um, cellular pathology. Uh, but he was saying medicine is a social science and politics is nothing else but medicine on a large scale. So how does that relate to the SDGs? And what I want to talk about is, I, I think, for our analysis, if we're going to make better progress towards the SDGs, if we're going to make the world a fairer, more equal, safer place, then we need two kinds of analysis. We need the analysis of what policies need to be. And we also need analysis about how to get there. Why are we not making more progress than we are? And we are making progress. So as you can see, this is the share of the populations around in different parts of the world living in extreme poverty over from 1981 to 2015. And you can see, you know, the trend is, is mostly downwards, unless you look at Africa, where it was going down also, but from uh, over the last 10 years or so, the share, even the share of population in extreme poverty has been going up. And this is looking at the numbers. And you can see there that, uh, that you just look at the bottom two lines, these are in millions. So you can see that um, it's gone down from all, just under 2 billion to uh, 696 million, uh, a third. You know, globally, the number of people, according to that measure of extreme poverty, has reduced by a third. Sub-Saharan Africa is almost doubled. And that's what we're experiencing, is that inequality is increasing much more. So in 1970, uh, a child born in sub-Saharan Africa faced uh, was the, the risk of dying before the fifth birthday was nine times greater than a child born in an industrialized country. By 2015, it was 11 times greater. $11,000 per person per year. That's the average spend per person per year on health care in the United States. In Ethiopia, it's 67 dollars per person per year. In the UK, mental health is incredibly badly resourced. It's a, a major crisis in the country. Nevertheless, there are 12,500 psychiatrists uh, in the UK. In Sierra Leone, and this is a country that suffered the most devastating of violent civil wars, lots of people living with post-traumatic stress disorder, huge need for mental health care. There are two psychiatrists uh, for the country. So what's preventing us? We all know this is wrong. What's preventing us making change? And I'm going to focus on two policy ideas that are about not the policies that we implement so much as what policies might we adopt as a movement uh, and, uh, and as policy people trying to bring in policies, what approaches might be used to try and unlock some of the barriers to progress. And a lot of it is about focusing on the causes rather than the visible manifestations of symptoms. So in, this is a health uh, uh, diagram that we tend to look at the diseases, we tend to look at the surface of the iceberg, but we tend to focus much less on the underlying economic causes, the causes of poverty, uh, the, the behaviours that, that drive the disease. And We've just been hearing from uh, from Ganesh a really, really important one. And these are some of the root determinants. If you want to address the SDGs, you want to reduce poverty. These are some of the things that we need to bring about want to reduce hunger. These are some of the issues that we need to uh, be addressing. And I'm not going to talk through them all, but you can see that for each of these, they're hugely controversial. There are huge, uh, powerful vested interests in most of them at, uh, trying to keep things as they are. And people have, you know, we all have, we have vested interest in wanting to believe that things are really better as they are. You know, it sounds like it'd be good to do X, Y and Z, but really it, it, it wouldn't. And 
a, a bit of a taboo about getting involved in religious organisations, charities, legislation that prevents you getting involved in too many political issues. I want to highlight two particular ones that we might want to change our approach to. And the first is the aid narrative. Now, I was sat watching um, a programme, BBC programme called Question Time, where the audience put questions to politicians and discuss issues in BBC. And they were discussing aid. And the audience was a lot, it tends to be a bit of a different audience according to where in the country it was. This was probably one of the poorer parts of the UK. And there was a lot of hostility to aid. The fact that we've got all this poverty in this country and yet we're giving this, you know, people don't know the numbers really, but it sounds like vast, 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 vast quantities of wealth away. We're giving it to Africa. We've been doing it for so, so long. And the unchallenged assumption in the room, even from those who are wanting to defend the aid budget, was all, but I know we're um, suffering here, but we're a generous nation. It's the kind of people we are. We have to do the right thing. We always have. We always will. So it's still important that we give to those who are even worse off than we are. The sense is, for a while, that might work. But the sense, but how long? We've been doing it for decades and decades and decades. You, have, you have, start to have a vested interest in believing there must be something wrong with this continent, that, that it still needs our charity in the form of aid, after all these years, you become a fertile ground for the tabloid newspapers saying, well, but it's because it, they're all corrupt. The aid's wasted. Uh, it just fuels corruption. People, You create a, a, a vested interest in people to want to believe that. It creates an anger uh, with the aid budget and it, and it creates an anger with the other. It fuels, in our opinion, the rise of, of, of populism, that fuels the rise of racism. And one of the most ugly things about it is it divides people. It tells the, those suffering from poverty in countries like the UK that they are on the opposite side to those suffering from poverty in Africa. It's them or it's us. Well, in actual fact, they're on the same side. You know, the, the, the inequality now is global. What we used to call the global south and the global north isn't as geographic as it used to be. You still have power imbalances between nations, but increasingly you have a global elite. You have billionaires in Africa. You have people starving in the UK. So the aid narrative, is totally counterproductive if you're wanting to generate finance and develop action to try and uh, address those things. It, uh, when Boris Johnson was Prime Minister of the UK and wanted to cut the aid budget, he was able to do it and it was politically popular for him to do it. Uh, this comes back to what Nish was talking about was part of this. That narrative that people have believed, they believe that uh, Africa is a recipient of charity from the rest of the world. The truth is, we're a recipient of wealth from Africa, uh, a net loss each uh, each year of $58 billion, 134 in, 192 out. The aid, which is gets such high profile, is only 30 billion out of 100 in, 192 billion going out. What we need to do, instead of um, focusing on uh, on aid, change the narrative, and if instead we focus on inequality, it changes everything. The Labour government, um, uh, sorry, the Labour Party, before they came into government, was introduced the uh, policy idea saying that they would introduce alongside tackling poverty to the Department for International Development, the aid department. They're also tackling inequality. And that's a great thing because it changes the metrics that you measure. Tackling inequality also starts up means bring, uh, bringing in tax measures, which releases finance for uh, uh, social development. But it doesn't change the narrative. It's still, it's an add-on. You could actually make the whole thing about tackling inequality. Everyone can see that's wrong, that the richest 1% get nearly twice as much wealth as the rest of the world put together. That narrative unites people. It reunites the poor in the global north and the global south. So why not change the name, the labelling, change the framing of our cause from helping the poor to uh, working for global equality, call it global equality, call the, uh, uh, the aid budget the Global Equality Fund.
that uh, unites rather than divide. It um, addresses uh, power and, and 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 governance holds that that the those in positions of power to account. Because it's inequality. Look at in, tapping inequality of power, not just inequality of wealth. Uh, and it's a much harder thing to argue against uh, than than uh, arguing that giving aid doesn't work. Hard to argue that tapping inequality doesn't work. And one particular uh, policy approach is uh, the idea of global public investment, which I won't talk about now, but it basically moves to a model where all countries in the world potentially give 0.7% of their GDP to um, uh, a global fund for public good. Um, and this is then distributed around the world uh, according to need. Uh, so all countries contribute. All countries benefit to different extents, of course, according to need. Uh, and all countries have a voice, all decide. Then the second one is the war on drones. Now, this, I haven't got time to talk through uh, these in detail, but the war on drugs profoundly impacts on so many of the SDGs. And yet, most of them in the voluntary, in the development sector, don't discuss it. And that's primarily, I think, because it, it's a very controversial issue. It's something that people steer away from. But one of the biggest is, biggest problems is is, is governance, that uh, we, we all know what happened in Prohibition area America. Um, we've got that writ large across the world, making the drugs that huge global trade, which isn't going to go away. We buy Forcing it underground, it means you can't regulate it. You put immense wealth into the hands of organized crime, and that wealth is invested in corrupting government. It's invested in state capture. Um, it means that that huge, huge trading center isn't taxed. For some of the poorer countries, that's a large proportion of GDP. That means there's no revenue for public services. You also haven't got accountable governance to, uh, to deliver public services. They're basically illicit corporations of drug cartels, completely free of regulation, no union rights for the workers. The fueling of armed conflict, they tend to be in the marginalized places, so it particularly damages indigenous people and racial minorities. There's a whole gender analysis of it. It uh, impacts uh, very badly on uh, uh, the role of women in particular as well. It means you can't take a public health approach to drugs. You can't regulate the supply you, uh, to, in, in order to uh, have health messages on, uh, to regulate so people know what strength they're getting. Uh, opioids, uh, painkillers have been uh, in some parts of the world because of overregulation made very difficult to access. People involved in drug trade can't access state services. And climate change. A lot of the forests, the rainforests that we need to protect we discuss it with governments at, at, at the COP, but those governments aren't in a position of power to be able to protect the rainforest, and certainly lots of parts of Latin America, because those marginalized areas where the rainforests are is controlled by the drug cartels. Um, and finally, the cost. The war on drugs, the spend annually, is about the same as the global aid budget, so it wastes so much resource. And yet, we never talk about it. So. If we instead, what we want is simply uh, to replace blanket prohibition with legal controls, approach drugs as a public health issue, and um, uh, rather than, uh, the, the, than law enforcement, evidence-based policy, transfer responsibility from the uh, crime uh, law enforcement department to the departments of public health and to the sector that we're in, engage in, a, in drug policy as a social development issue. Thank you.